Good morning or good evening or good afternoon. A warm welcome to this opening session of the East Asian Institute's annual academic conference. My name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the director of the East Asian Institute. I would like to extend a special welcome to our keynote speaker of this morning, the Honorable Minister Lo Ji Wei, who will, will be formally introduced in a moment. Also welcome to all the conference participants from around the world and to our online guests in this opening session. The topic of the conference, China's fiscal policies for the new era, is absolutely critical for China at this point in time, as many of the other reforms that China aspires to, including hukou reforms, including financial sector reforms, rely on a very solid fiscal basis. Uh, at the in East Asian Institute, we will be discussing these topics uh, over the next two days with some of the best experts on China's economy and its fiscal system. And we will conclude with a panel discussion on Friday morning, which will again be open to the public. So if you'd like to join that, please register for that session as well. Two logistical remarks. First, for interpretation, you will find an interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little globe. And please uh, set your preferred language, either English or Chinese, and what you want to listen in. Second, Minister Lo has kindly agreed to take some questions after his keynote speech. And please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen again to write your questions along with your name and affiliation. And I shall be moderating the question and answer session. I now give the floor to Dr. Tay Kok Pang, who is the chairman of the East Asian Institute for his welcome remarks and the introduction of the keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the opening session of the annual conference of the East Asia Institute. This year's topic, China's future fiscal policies, is highly timely and relevant. The last major overhaul of China's fiscal system was in 1994. Given how much China has changed since, and the new priorities and challenges that have emerged. There is a need to review the fiscal system to make it more fit for purpose. And there is no better keynote speaker for this conference than Minister Lo Chi Wei. Minister Lo worked at the apex of China's macro management for many years. He was Vice Minister of Finance from 1998 to 2007 and Minister of Finance from 2013 to 2016. In between these appointments, he was Chairman of China Investment Corporation, and he has also been Chairman of the National Social Security Trust Fund and Central Huichin Investment. He's currently the Director of the 13th CPPCC Foreign Affairs Committee. Under Premier Chu Rongqi, Minister Lo helped design the 1994 fiscal reform, the tax sharing system, which improved significantly the central government share of fiscal revenue, putting it on a sound footing. As Vice Minister of Finance, he initiated a wide ranging package of budget reforms, installed a treasury management system, and elevated the role of the National People's Congress in budget approval. As Minister of Finance, he led the 2015 revisions of the budget law that committed China to medium-term budgeting and improved reporting and transparency. These changes have placed China's budget management closer to international best practice. Minister Law was also the architect of China Investment Corporation, or CIC, established in 20. 2007 and became his first chairman. The CIC, inspired by Singapore's GIC, was similarly designed to invest China's growing external reserves in longer term assets to provide a higher rate of return. When I was working in GIC, I remember receiving a delegation of officials from the People's Bank of China, China Central Bank wanting to understand more fully how CIC, how GIC, sorry, was organized. 
When Minister Lowe was newly appointed as CIC's chairman, I remember visiting him together with Dr. Edwin Lim, a senior, a former senior World Bank official, and Professor Michael Spence, the Nobel laureate. We were most interested to hear his views for CIC. For CIC. In the 1980s and 1990s, Minister Lowe's influence reached far beyond fiscal management. He was a key member of the team of young reformers who included Zhou Xiaochuan and Kuo Su Qing. Working together with Professor Wu Xingliang, they helped shape China's socialist market economy that made China the economic powerhouse it has become. Today, Minister Lo is a regular contributor to the debate on economic policies in China. His speeches and publications make him one of the most prominent economic thinkers in China. He has a reputation for speaking his mind, for seeking truth from facts, and for practical thinking. We all look forward to hearing him speak. It now gives me great pleasure to invite Minister Lo Chi Wei to give his keynote address. Over to you, Minister Lo. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. I'm very glad to uh, see my old friend, Dr. Hoffman. This time it was uh, by the invitation of Christine and the topic I was given is financial system reform and future prospect in new China. So I will follow this topic. In the context of China, New Era refers to the 18th National Congress of the Communist Party of China in November 2012, but it has not yet ended. In 2013, the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee meeting adopted the decision on comprehensively de deepening the reform of some major issues uh, and planned major reform tasks and implementation roadmap until 2020. Uh, the reform of fiscal and tax taxation system was included in it and there was a uh, dedicated chapter on the planning. It was uh, 17, 18 and 19 chapter. Uh, the first sentence is that fiscal management is the basis and a uh, major pillar of uh, national governance. A scientific taxation system is a mechanism protecting the resource allocation, maintaining the unification of the market and promote the fairness of the society uh, and for longer government governance of the country. Now, this is the first time to uh, come up to propose some detailed or specific tasks to uh, enhance the improve the legislation, 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 clarify the powers, reforms the tax system, stabilize the tax burden, makes the budget transparent, improve the efficiency, and establish a modern financial system to give full play to the initiative of the central and local government. So I would like to introduce the financial system reform of China in the new era in combination of these specific tasks. So I will elaborate on in four aspects about improving legislation, legislation um, um, and three others and then uh, two others and then about the outlook of the future. First, I will talk about improving the legislation. In 1995, the first budget law came into effect, which played an important role in standardizing budget management and deepening 
text sharing of uh, text sharing reform. It was an important achievement of fiscal and taxation system reform in 1994. At that time, the reform focused on the tax system and the tax sharing system, mainly on the initial establishment of a tax system adapted to the market economy and the fiscal and taxation relationship between the central and local government. But the budget management system was not the focus. In order to enhance the integrity and scientific uh, principles of budget preparation and execution, since the late 1990s, a series of major reforms of the public budget management has been continuously introduced, such as department budget classification of government revenue and expenditure, budget disclosure, centralized treasury collection and payment, government procurement, budget performance management, and cancellation of government extra budgetary funds. In 2015, the second budgetary law or budgetary uh, budget bill came into re effect, expanding from 79 items to 101 items. The new budget law systematically summarizes the achievements of the reform of the public budget management and determines uh, and, and defines them in the form of a law. It makes strict provisions on important issues such as the integrity of the budget con content, the scientific principle, uh, reasonableness of budget preparation, the standardization of the budget execution, the seriousness of the budget supervision and openness of budget activities, and strengthens the examination and supervision of the budget by the legislative department. Article 1 of the new budget law stipulates this law is formulated in accordance with the Constitution in order to regulate the government's revenue and expenditure behavior, strengthen budget constraints, strengthen budget management and supervision, establish and improve a comprehensive, standardized, open and transparent pop, uh, budget system, and ensure the healthy development of the economy and society. Article 2 stipulates the preparation, the examination, approval, and supervision of the budget and final accounts, as well as the implementation and adjustment of the budget, shall be carried out in accordance with the provisions of this law. <clears throat> Through budget reform, a double entry budget system has been established, which includes general public uh, budget, government budget fund budget, state-owned capital management budget, and social insurance fund budget. The budget law confirms this system and stipulates the balance, balance the relationship between them. It also requires all the government revenues as and expenditures should be included in the budget, which strengthens the integrity of the budget. After the continued reform, all extra budgetary, budgetary funds have been uh, cancelled in 2011, which is equivalent to the end of the uh, of the period. So after continuous uh, reforms, the uh, extra budgetary funds have been all cancelled, uh, which is equivalent to the uh, the end of the project. The budget law also clearly stipulates the starting point of the budget preparation, the, the time of budget submission and review, and also the time of implementation after the budget review is passed. Uh, the time when general budgets at all levels and departmental budgets are made public to the to the to the to the people and the review procedure if the any adjustments are needed in budget implementation. The efficiency of budget preparation and implementation has always has also been improved. The re review and the supervision of the budget by the legislature and the transparency of the budget have been strengthened. According to the requirements of the decision, so called, the budget law will expand and focus of the budget review from the balance state and deficit scale to exp to expenditure budget and policies.
uh, it gives a lot of uh, strict uh, restrictions to uh, government's policy, including the expenditures, how it executes its ex expenditures. And uh, government's financial expenditures also have to be implemented according to the approved budget. The revenue budget should also be changed from task to expectations. When the budget is a task, the budget revenue collection department often adopts the method of early collection or exemption or deferment so as to ensure that the revenue task is completed on time and in full. So this new budget law uh, gives uh, requirements uh, to the local governments and uh, the relevant department, they have to collect uh, or to um, meet the targets on time and they cannot collect more or collect less or defer or collect early. So this is very different from the past. In the past, it was very task oriented. And uh, with the new law, it is more uh, re regulated and transparent and on schedule. And uh, also it creates a cycle for all the departments to follow. In a system uh, like this, it is easier to implement and complete all the tasks. And in terms of uh, over collection or uh, under collection, or if it's on, on time, or when the economy is overheated or not uh, acti activate, not active enough, this comes in very handy in regulating the market. And also in the past, task-based revenue budget had uh, the characteristics of, of uh, planned economy and also produce a pro uh, cycle, a pro cycle mechanism. In 1995, the budget law, it requires that the, both the local and the central government, uh, it has to follow the rules strictly. Also, it requires that local and, and uh, central government, they can issue bonds, issue debt, which was not uh, very reasonable. But uh, actually, after the law is passed, the central uh, the central budget has deficits every year. In 1998, in response to the impact of the Asian financial crisis, the, ex the expanded fiscal policy was ex implemented, which increased the central and the local budget deficits. Um, after that, the budget submitted to the National People's Congress every year listed not only the central deficit, but also the local deficit and national deficit, which were all approved. This also shows that in uh, the 1995 budget law has lagged behind the reality. According to the new budget law, both the central government and local government can make deficits and they can raise funds by issuing government bonds and local general bonds, which finally make, makes up for this def, uh, defect. Local budget deficit can only correspond to the shortage of some funds for public welfare capital expenditure, this is the golden rule. And that is, it cannot be used for recurrent expenditure because it cannot benefit future generations. The central government's physical deficit does not have these restrictions. And the central government needs to arrange a large amount of recurrent expenditure to make transfer payments to local governments. According to the authorizations of the National People's Congress, the State Council distributes special debt lines to all lo localities within the total amount approved by the National People's Congress. All lo localities can issue special bonds within the quota to invest in public welfare to projects with um, the local uh, in public welfare projects to, with certain income. If the project income is insufficient, it will be repaid by the corresponding government funds or special income. 
So special fund financing fund, special bond financing funds do not have to be included in the local general budget deficit. It's a, a similar to the municipal bonds of local governments in the United States. So in short, the amendment to the budget law in 1915 uh, 2015, sorry, reflected the requirements of the third plenary sessions of the 18th CPC Central Committee to ensure the integrities and the scientific rationalism and openness of the budget at the legal level and also strengthen the overall supervision of the legislature over the budget management. So the, the second part is to about the clear powers. The, the decision puts forward uh that uh with the established system and that is more compatible with the an administrative power and expenditure expenditure responsibility it can moderately strengthen the central government's power and expenditure responsibilities with national defense foreign affairs national security and rules and management of the unified national market as the central government's and uh, part of the social security, the construction and the maintenance of the major trans regional projects, et cetera, um, as the common power of the central and local government. And, and here you can see that uh, this is actually a very classic line and to empower or to um, authorize local government to take up more responsibility is the key to run the system. So the local government should well bear and and share the expenditure responsibilities according to the divisions of the powers. This is and uh, among them, the administrative power is a special financial term in China, especially the function of government. Uh, of governments at all levels. So in the past 10 years, according to the above requirements, a lot of work has been done in various fields of economic and social securities and so central and local gov uh, local powers and expenditure responsibilities have been clearly defined in financial supervisions, uh, environmental protection, supervision, judicial jurisdiction, domestic trade circulation, uh, and all these uh, reforms are rather um, the highlights of the overall uh, reform. Um, I think this reform especially is meaningful because for all this year, as the central and local governments, they overlap their responsibilities. And when it comes to execution, uh, all the departments are very bureaucratic. So once this new system is implemented. We don't see the overlapping of the functions that much. Uh, each department has its own respected, respective uh, function to, to exercise, which is uh, very uh, important when it comes to such a big uh, mechanisms to uh, to make it ex uh, to make it work and so for example the the marine management uh, you know for the for the the near shore management of the marine area uh, now is uh, designated to a certain department to take care of that and it's it's a it's a one line one line uh, management from top down and it's no longer overlapping so uh, it reduces a lot of resources wastage and because china has a lot of uh, its own uh, special characteristics um, uh, of, of of the management style um, another example uh, comes into the the judicial system. So some tr transitional measures had, had been taken, such as the circuit, circuit court of the Supreme Court, uh, because uh, all the courts at all levels in China are under the jurisdiction of the same level legislature, and the judiciary is localized. Judicial injustice will, in, in, will occur when dealing with cross-regional legal disputes. The establishment of 
a circuit court is conducive to improving cross-regional judicial fairness, but the circuit court is the agency of the Supreme Court, not an independent circuit court, and its function and powers are limited. So at the present, the largest division of uh, central government, central and local go government powers and expenditure responsibility is uh, the basic OH insurance system for enterprise employees. Um, according to the requirements of the decision, the rules and management related to the national unified market should be taken as the central authority. Uh, enterprise social uh, uh, endowment insurance, which related to the cross-regional flow of the labor force should be the central government's power and managed by the central government. So as you can see, it's much more divided. And uh, this, this uh, also gives certain flexibilities of the, of the labor market, um, also in terms of technology transfer, it's, it's uh, much more liquid and flexible. Uh, another another uh, interesting thing is that uh, uh, China has, from uh, from uh, 19, uh, 2018, it gradually when it gradually transitioned into the central unified management, um, we'll see some new changes on the labor uh, labor force as well as the uh, welfare uh, management. So starting from 2018, through the ways of Central Adjustment Fund, it will be transferred to the unified management of the whole country in a provincial basis. The payment base should be multiplied by the enterprise payment rate uh, uniformly in, stipulated by the state and uh, min, uh, multiplied by the adjustment fund rate, starting at 3.5% uh, increased by 0.5% every year. Um, so this is, as you can see, this is another uh, new measures that started from 2018. The National Adjustment Fund will be refunded according to the gap of the pension payable in various places. And uh, uh, just now I mentioned that uh, the new way of uh, calculating the, the fund rate is uh, starting at 3.5% and increasing by 0.5% every year. And now it's, of course, already uh, 6%, 7%. Uh, so as you can see, if we go by this rate, uh, we it will take quite a few years for them to reach the, the uh, desirable rate. But from 19, uh, 2019, all the welfare insurance premium uh, is collectively uh, charged by the National Taxation Bureau. And it does not, uh, it does not uh, uh, leave it to the individual department to collect any further. Uh, so it, this, this, this kind of social insurance contributions, um, of course, has many difficulties and which I will not stipulate here. But um, on the other hand, it's a long term reform that will eventually um, help to East the difficulty of local government because a lot of time they are unable to collect the social security um, premium. For OECD, the average is 61%. Uh, the proportion of the civil servants in central government is too low. Excluding incomparable factors such as military personnel and personnel involved in national security department, um, well, th these are um, unreasonable factors, usually not taken into account by some governments. The civil servants in the central government accounts for only 6% of the total number of civil servants in the country, which is even more internationally comparable if it is included in the teaching staff of the public schools. 
Uh, China only accounts for 4% in 2011, and OECD average is 41.41%. So there's a huge gap. So a lot of uh, affairs should be managed by the central government, but it's handed over to this local government, and the central government is only supervising them. And uh, there are many overlaps of uh, governance between the central and the local governments. Too many areas. And so thirdly, I'm going to talk about the reforming the tax system and stabilizing the tax burden. China's uh, current tax system framework was established in 1994 during the comprehensive reform. And at that time, the economy was in an overheated period or, or state. In order to curb the investment, the production-oriented value-added tax was adopted, and that is real estate and equipment were included in the scope of taxation and tax refund system at the end of the period was not abducted, uh, adopted. If there was an end of period now allowance, it would be transferred to the next period as input to, con to continue to be deducted. At that time, in order to simplify the operation and ensure success, only commodity production wholesale and retail were included in the scope of VAT. Uh, other services and, uh, and serv uh, are, are still subject to business tax as local tax. These practices were in, were in line with the economic situation at that time, but reduced the neutralization, uh, the neutral, neutral, uh, neutral degree of the VAT. In 2016, VAT was changed to consumption tax and business tax was changed to VAT. However, due to the lack of taxes suitable for local taxes, we have to change the value added tax to uh, the five, five, five versus five share tax of the central government. After the value added tax is changed to the consumption type, real estate and equipment will be included in the deduction scope. And end of the term allowance will be greatly increased. As I mentioned, 5 5 share tax is not fair for some regions because um, most of the equipments from the energy developed regions are imported from the developed regions. So for purchasing equipment and uh, their tax refund is 5-5, five, five, the half half, then it would not be a reasonable and fair approach. So the temporary approach adopted by the central fiscal policy is to take 82% of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the tax refund. Uh, the second is to improve the personal income tax. Before 1994, personal income tax was only levied on foreigners. Personal income adjustment tax on residents, um, bonus tax on employees of SOEs and individual um, industrial and commercial income tax. Uh, on households, etc. So in 1994, there was a reform to unify the personal income tax, uh, which was levied according to 11 categories without special deductions. The reform is an important step. At that time, the comprehensive income tax was not adopted, and the employees of the companies with different ownerships adopted different systems and the reform of SOE had not yet started, and the tax collection and management capability was weak. So the classified collection was conducive to adapting to, adapting to different systems, and uh, tax collection and management was relatively simple. So the decision puts forward a comprehensive and classified personal income tax system that should be gradually established. According to its direction, the reform has been carried out step by step since the new era. In 2018, the 
NPCSC made Seventh Amendment to the Individual Income Tax Law, which was implemented in the following year, and established a comprehensive and classified individual income tax system. A comprehensive tax was imposed on some labor income, and six special additional deductions were set up. The basic fee deduction standard will be raised was raised from 3,500 yuan to 5,000 yuan per month. Well, actually, it was not right. In fact, after adding special um, additional deduction items, the basic deduction should be reduced. It shouldn't be um, elevated. And a comprehensive income is applicable to the progressive tax rate of 3% to 45%. Different tax rates are stipulated for various categories of income. Interest on deposit is exempted, 20% of the dividend income is taxed, and capital gains are, well, actually, uh, capital gains are not taxed. This makes the progressiveness of personal income tax very low. For example, 80% of the bank deposits are held by 10% of the people, and the rich get more capital gains. Relative speaking, the progressive nature of the current personal income tax is more reflected on the wage earners with higher incomes. After the amendment of the law, uh, another effect is that a proportion of the individual index ta in income tax payers in urban areas have dropped from 45, 44% to 15%. Personal income tax accounts for a lower proportion in fiscal revenue, accounting for about 8% of the all tax revenue and about 5% of all fiscal revenue. Uh, in OECD countries, this number is more than 20%. And in developed uh, developed countries, uh, is more than ten percent. Third, the decision also proposes to improve the local tax system and gradually increase the proportion of direct tax. According to the requirement, property tax should be established. So after eighteenth, uh, after the third meeting. Third session of the 18th CPC Congress. Um, according to the requirement, property tax uh, legislation was started soon. The legislation was led by a budget committee of the MPC with the cooperation of the Ministry of Finance and the State Taxation Bureau of the PRC. There were many difficulties in legislation, and the biggest one is how to value the property. Generally speaking, the housing with complete property rights and unstrict restricted transactions should be taken as valuation benchmark. But in reality, a large number of the housing property rights are incomplete and transactions are limited. So the solution is to give an appropriate discount based on the benchmark valuation by 40%, 50%, or even 70%. But the problem is very complicated. Um, for different categories of properties, how do you discount that? So it's quite complicated. And uh, there are many other difficulties. So as a result, this tax law has not been formally enacted after years of exploration. Uh, I've seen the draft, but I've, I haven't seen the formal law passed. So in October 2021, uh, the MPCSC authorized the State Council to conduct a pilot project in some areas of property tax reform, which can be said to, to be an exploration with problem. Considering the current economic situation, the Ministry of Finance announced that it would not have it, it, it was not equipped with the conditions to expand the pilot cities of the property tax reform in 2022, which of course is realistic. Fourth, the decision requires stable tax burden. Over the years, 
Many market participants think China's macro tax burden is high. According to the statistics of Ministry of Finance, the macro tax burden in China is 28 to 29 percent, which is lower than the average level of the comparable countries. Um, in the market, uh, a lot of people are seeing 34, 35 percent tax burdens. I think the biggest difference is how to calculate the revenue from the transfer of state-owned land. I remember that around 2000, IMF communicated with our MOF. It believed that China's macro tax burden was apparently lower than 25 percent. Uh, the MOF thinks the revenue from the transfer of state-owned land should be considered, while IMF thinks that this is a state-owned asset transfor transformed from fiscal form to cash form, so it couldn't be classified as a fiscal income. So through discussion, both parties reached an agreement and consensus that the first level development expenses such as land acquisition, demolition, compensation, and basic municipal construction uh, revenue should be detected from the revenue f uh, from the transfer of state-owned land, and the net income should be listed as comparable fiscal revenue of the government. At that time, the net income accounted for 60 percent, but now it only accounts for about 30 percent. According to this calculation, in 2019, the national tax revenue plus the net income of the social insurance, social security fund, after deducting the financial subsidies plus the net income of the state-owned uh, land transfer fees, will form a total revenue of the state according to uh, accordingly uh, which is about 28 to 29 percent of the GDP so in the recent three years due to the impact of various unfavorable mark uh, factors the economic growth has been lower than expected the macro tax burden has been reduced by adopting stimulus policy of the tax reduction and fee reduction after the economy turns to normal growth, measures should be taken to stabilize the macro tax burden and maintain appropriate financial resources, which is conducive to promoting development balance between regions and, equal and equalization of basic public services and redistribution of income. In short, in the past 10 years since entering the new era, the public finance system, financial system has consolidated and developed um, with the achievements of the previous reforms in accordance with the requirements of the decision, and has carried out a wide range of gradual reforms, initially establishing a modern financial system. Let me talk about the problems uh, of further reform. Um, and a future outlook. The development, future development of financial system needs problem orientation. First, we need to establish tax uh, suitable for local tax. Second, dissolve and suppress the local implicit bond issues. And third, truly establish a system that is compatible with the administrative power and expenditure res uh, responsibility. First of all, the property tax is the most suitable tax as a local tax, which should be piloted as soon as possible after the economy turns into normal growth. Incomplete property rights and restricted transactions are indeed the biggest difficulties in real estate or property tax legislation. The main difficulty lies in the implementation of different land systems in urban and rural areas. And also the land in cities and towns is owned by the whole by, by people. And the, the but the state has the has the use control, has the land use control. Uh, include the plot ratio, specification, so on and so forth. So urban enterprises and residents have the right to independently transfer uh, their property, including the associated land use right according to the market price under the state specification and the corresponding 
real estate valuation um, is relatively simple. So I think in this way, it, it would be it make it make the in, internal in, uh, entire system easier to accept to be accepted. Also, rural land is collectively owned, and the farmers have the right to use the home state. Uh, however, the transfer of the right is limited. And you can only be transferred free of charge within the collective uh, where they are located. It can be stipulated that farmers' houses are not subject to real estate tax or property tax. However, there's no use control plan for rural collective land. And there's no pilot plot ratio specification for uh, homestead and collective construction land. A large number of houses are built on a considerable number of homesteads and sublet or resale, uh, which form uh, illegal small property houses. So how to value these small property houses is indeed a difficult problem. In the pilot, uh, exploration can be carried out in combination with the reform of the land system. Uh, finally, to solve this problem, I think we need to break the dual system structure of urban and rural land. Also, it is also uh, also it is possible to shift the collection of consumption tax of some items back to retail, and the change and change the central tax to local tax accordingly. Um, after the establishment of the local tax system, we can consider changing the value added tax to the central tax. Uh, the value uh, the in the production, circulation, and consumption of products and services. VAT is widely levied, uh, levied across across regions and all countries, regarded as a, as regarded as a central tax, which is conducive to the establishment of a unified domestic market, and the systematic implementation implementation of tax refund at the end of the period, uh, also uh, make it a little bit more easier to implement. Uh, VAT paying enterprises really become tax barriers and finally pass on to consumers' burdens. So the VAT rate setting can be further improved, I believe. And the regressive way of calculating VAT can be reduced. If the local tax is still insufficient, we can learn from Japan's consumption tax. So it's their so-called value-added tax and allocate some value-added tax revenues to local areas according to the proportion of total retail sales. Um, the company's enterprise income tax and personal income tax can continue to be shared by the central and local government. Of course, these two taxes themselves still have room for improvement. Secondly, it is a major problem that must be solved in the future to efficiently curb the, in the implicit debt in increment of local governments and actively resolve the stock. According to the data of the MOF, at the end of 2020, the government debt of China was 46.55 trillion yuan, and the debt ratio was 45.8%. Among them, the central government's debt balance 20.89 trillion yuan, and uh, the local government's debt balance is 25.66 trillion RMB, all of which are controlled within the limits approved by the People's Congress. So I think we should uh, further uh, stabilize uh, the debt issue of the local government. The budget law regulates an issuance of bonds by local governments, and, the stip and it stipulates that in addition, local governments and their subordinate departments shall not borrow debt in any way. The local government and its subordinate departments shall not guarantee the debt of any unit or individual in any way. And that is to say the local implicit debt are usually borrowed by local financing platform companies, and that is local city investment companies. So as you can see, if we can uh, help to uh, to solve this problem efficiently, we are able then to reduce the debts locally.
。那么隐性债务呢，主要由承收承收公司呢抵借。So this type of uh implicit implicit or very uh hidden uh debt is. Uh, the, 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 the local implicit debts are usually borrowed by local financing platform companies. Um, so that is the city investment companies uh, I just mentioned. Those companies are not government departments, and the local governments do not provide guarantees. So the lenders often hold the belief of city investment and think that the local government will eventually um, help because they will not let the financing platform company go bankrupt. And so the local governments are also often hold the belief of salvation role, believing that the central government will not let the local finance go bankrupt and will eventually rescue them. So as a result, the government's implicit debt is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so usually issuing structure, structural fixed income production with high interest rate um, is just um, exacerbated. So in recent years, the financial supervision have, has been continuously strengthened, and this kind of products have been banned. Moreover, the central government has cons constantly expressed its position and issued documents demanding that the local hidden debts has to be resolved on their own, and it has to be resolutely curbed that the local financing platform companies should be cleaned up and standardized and also that their uh, government financing functions should be stripped off, and that lo those who lose their solvency should be subject to bankruptcy rate organizations or liquidation according to the law. Uh, improve market-oriented and debt default disposal mechanism is also a key. And this will encourage debtors and creditors to negotiate and dispose of existing debt the central government has also made it clear that the MOF has repeatedly expressed its position, and that is the central government will not uh, inter interfere, and uh, it will not interfere unnecessarily, and you will refuse assistance if they don't um, help on their own. So this can then curb uh, local uh, hidden debt also to uh, resolve the sum of existing ones. But some analysts believe that the main reason for the excessive local invisible or hidden debt is that the local authorities assume too much power. And uh, but the financial resource, but the financial resources are limited. They are insufficient. And I think this view is not accurate. The local governments do do have uh, too many powers, but through large-scale central transfer payments, local financial resources are sufficient. In 2019, the transfer payment from, from the central government to the local government was 7.5 trillion RMB. Among them, the general transfer payment budget is 6.68 trillion RMB, including the transfer uh, payment of common financial affairs of 323 million RMB, which is the largest item. The local Special transfer payment is 772.8 billion RMB, which usually corresponds to the expenditure entrusted by the central government. The local public budget expenditure is 20.37 trillion RMB, while the central government expenditure is only 3.6 trillion RMB. So it's only actually 4%. It's not seen in the world at all. The more, more important reason is that since the reform and opening up, China has formed an institutional pattern in which all, all the localities compete with each other and try their best to maintain high growth. So this has both advantages and disadvantages. For a period of time, it has indeed contributed to high economic growth. But there have also been some phenomena that some places have exceeded their financial resources, evaded legal constraints and illegally borrow money to engage in capital uh, constructions. Since the new era, the economy has turned to high quality growth, which has done more the harm than good. In addition to effectively curbing the implicit debt uh, increment of local governments and actively resolving the, the existing debt, it is necessary to make a fundamental reform in the division of administrative power and expenditure responsibilities. 
Third, the decision proposes to establish a system that is compatible, compatible with the administrative power and expenditure responsibility. In a narrow sense, this reform task has been basically completed. However, there have been a large number of central and local joint power and central interested local powers um, situation. So just now I gave you the, the basic situation of the national uh, general budget expenditure, especially some common uh, expenditures, uh, the general budget expenditures and um, the, the, the budget that's transferred from the central to the local government. And also I tell you what the uh, local government's responsibilities and how what are the the funds and the resources that they should be utilized and should be uh, taken care of according to the international practice which love which level of government's power should be executed by the government at a, at the same level um in, in regards of that this task has not been fully realized so as mentioned earlier the establishment of the circuit court of the Supreme Court is conducive to the improvement of cross-regional judicial fairness. However, the circuit court is an agency of the Supreme Court and is not an independent circuit court. So it cannot accept the first instance and can only correct the matter of justice made by local high courts in cross-regional judicial cases through the second instance. However, quite a number of such cases have been concluded at a second instance in local intermediate courts, and further appeals are quite troublesome. So if the court is changed to, to uh, the court that should be given the right function, which is exclusively responsible for the first instance of cross-regional civil and major criminal, criminal cases, it will then make the, the the process much easier and this reform can be said to be truly completed and it will involve the revision of the constitutions um, i think uh this was it was it was the reform was very actually quite smooth until the very last minute uh, because of the constitution. Uh, so I think this becomes the biggest impediment uh, to complete this reform. The quality of supervision of cross-regional sales of goods and drugs should, be belong, should belong to the central authority. And a central supervision institution to the FDA of the United States should be set up to be responsible for its implementation. And the current practice is that the relevant departments of the central government guide local counterparts to implement management. And accordingly, a large number of common power transfer payments have been arranged. The disadvantage of the system is quite obvious. Uh, local governments pay more attention to local interest and the supervision is, is lack. So food and drug quality and safety in, in, in this incidents happen from time to time. There are many cases in this respect, and it is difficult to list them all. In the national financial data, it shows a huge number, huge amount of common financial affairs and the transfer payment of central interested affairs. If the relationship in this respect, in respect is straightened out, the number of central and local common affairs and entrusted affairs can be significantly reduced, and the difficulty of clearly dividing the central and local power can be reduced. And we think that in this case, the local uh, transfer payments will be reduced, the central expenditure at the same level will increase, and the proportion of central civil servants will also increase. Local governments should focus more on local powers and a small number of common powers, which is conducive to giving full and scientific play to the initiative of the central and local governments. As an important part of promoting the modernization of national governance system and government's capacity, the reform of 
administrative power involves the relationship between local uh, and uh, central government, between government and market government and society central, uh, and covers all fields of politics, economy, society, cultural, culture, and ecological civilization. It's, it is a very complex and systematic project. But once again, finance is the foundation and important pillar of national governance. And a scientific, physical, and taxation system is the institutional guarantee for optimizing resources allocations, maintaining market unity, and promoting social equity. equity. Finally, it can realizing it can realize long-term stability of the country. So in the new era, further establishing of the modern physical and financial system will be an extension, profound, compre comprehensive reform. And this is my speech for you all. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister Lo. This was a fantastic, uh, a fantastic overview of the reforms that have happened over the past thirty years, really, but also what still needs to happen. And I and I appreciate very much your detail on the on the budget law and the implications of that on the uh, various tax reforms that have been going on in the past decade and a half. Uh, and I think it, it it dispels the the notion that no reforms have taken place in the past. 10, 15 years. As a matter of fact, a lot of reforms, but maybe a bit out of the limelight, have been happening indeed. Uh, just to repeat for everybody, uh, please use the Q&A button to, uh, to uh, um, uh, issue your questions, and I will hope to manage them as we, as we go along. Uh, there's already a number of questions in the box, but let me start with my question. Uh, one, of the big, one of the big objectives of the new era, as uh, President Xi has defined it, is common prosperity. So we went from the moderately prosperous society to a common prosperous society, say by 2035. Now, uh, President Xi has made very clear this is not going to be a welfare state. But then the question that I would like to raise is one, what, what is it that brings common prosperity? in your view? And second, what are the implications for China's fiscal system? Minister Law. Thank you. This is a big question. First of all, we have seen large gaps in income. Currently, the, the uh, Gini index is 0 0.466. The highest point is 0 0.48. And that is uh, the same as US. Uh, for developed countries besides US, the other countries have relatively lower Gini index, about 0. 4, 2, and Japan is about less than 0 0.4. Ours is 0 0.466, huge gap. Um, the reason is because uh, for the rural areas, uh, villages and um, towns, they are mostly going by a binary system is which is a family-based system and of course there is land-based system um, it's, it's a binary structure system for different villages and the manpower flow is relatively easy however for the population with uh, rural hukou to come into urban areas is very difficult so if you look at the urban regions all the workers the, the we call them the farmer workers they don't have the hukou 
in the urban area. So this is a cause of the income gap. The disposable income of the rural residents and urban residents is about 2.5 times. That means the disposable income of the urban residents is 2.5 times that of the rural residents. And half of the income of the farmers are actually coming from um, the workers, uh, you know, sent back from the the farmer workers sent back from from the, the urban areas uh, and 50 percent about 50 to 55 percent of uh, the population has the hukou in, in uh, rural areas but only about 30 people are actually there permanently and they these 30 percent of the people are working on really farming agriculture and that creates a gdp of eight percent and if you look at 20 uh, 30 percent of the population creating eight percent of the gdp of course the income is low the per capita income is low and and this is because of um, the binary system between the rural and urban areas and that's the hukou system and the land system which needs to be improved in order to result in a better allocation of income so we can i mean i did a calculation we can actually reduce it to, to the the, uh, the gini index to 0 0.4 um talking about fiscal reallocation we can provide more equal public services and tax uh, i give an example about personal income tax the accumulation progressively is not strong and the uh tax were more of a heavy burden on the waged workers rather than the wealthy people and so this is the restrictions we need to break uh, but the rudimentary reason is urbanization we need to push for urbanization otherwise we can't solve the basic public service problems for a widely dispersed residential area it is very difficult to provide coverage of the services to give you a few examples uh, um, for example primary schools in rural area rural regions uh, the total number of students is about 80 and it's difficult to set up a school for many villages you can't set up a school for 80 students and you can't find 80 students so a lot of the students were sent to urban areas and can you actually provide public services such as primary school to uh, the rural areas it's difficult because the residents are wide disturbed uh, dispersed geographically and in 2021 some departments have uh, a misunderstanding about the common prosperity and in 2021 the central economic uh, work group meetings has uh, done a rectification so first we need to carry out reforms to create a bigger pie and then we distribute the pie and we shouldn't be trapped uh, we shouldn't fall into the trap of uh, the welfare state such as the latin america countries i agree this is right but it's very difficult to implement well thank you thank you very much um a question from uh, William Shaw, um, and it's, it's really one of the topics also that we're going to discuss in the conference. We, we see a lot of expenditures rising and quite rapidly, and you mentioned the pension system, but there's also the health system, probably the education system, especially the rural education system, requires a lot more spending. Uh, as, the, as society ages, there will be other long-term care, some of that will come to government. 
So we see quite a bit of expenditure needs arising. At the same time, the revenue base has been declining or the tax revenue base has been declining. And some of the land revenues important for local government have been declining as well in the last couple of years. So what do you see as the key additional sources of revenues going forward, say, in the next five to 10 years? Um, I don't believe there are a lot of external, extra source of revenue. Um, you have to go through uh, reforms of uh, taxation system, like property tax is a big revenue source. Uh, uh, just now I mentioned for property tax, uh, there's a big issue is the binary, binary structure of the land system. Um, you need to change that and uh, then there will be lots of tax revenue sources and there shouldn't be any revenue about uh, SOE, uh, state-owned uh, land sales. There's only property tax and this is continuous taxation. SOE, uh, state-owned land sales is an auction after a collection um, it's a one-time thing so that's why it results in some distortion of the city development and so you have to continually auction sell uh, the land so we want to give it up uh, we want to transform it to property tax uh, continuously then this is a possibility of continuous source of re uh, revenue for local government uh, in terms of the VAT, we shouldn't reduce the VAT rate, uh, but improve, uh, uh, but to maintain uh, the accumulative refund rate, uh, it's uh, it's currently is thirty seven percent. We should increase it to forty three percent at the highest point. Uh, for custom duties, it's about seven percent of the our national fiscal revenue, which is very low. In comparable, in compar comparable among comparable countries, China is the lowest in terms of custom duty. Of course, it's not a direction f uh, for us to elevate the custom duty. So, to issue long term, that's is not really a good way because you have to pay back the debt. Um, yeah. On, on the issue of that, we have a, a, an interesting question of uh, Sean Roach, uh, who used to be with uh, Standard & Poor's. So he's been looking a lot at government debt. Uh, his question is, there seems to be a tendency or a, a, an understanding at the central government level that the Maastricht criteria of the 3% deficit for central government is appropriate. The question is A, is that right? Is that the right impression? But B, the question is, is that the right number, 3% for China? Um, well, for deficit rate, um, how much is it? Uh, uh, how much is, is a good one? Uh, that is actually determined uh, based on the economic situation when we carried out the reverse cycle adjustment. 3% uh, shouldn't be a leverage, it shouldn't ex go ex exceeding 3%, but 3% um, is more like a belief um, in, in a faith in China. But this is something self-defined in Europe. Uh, but if you look at France, they actually broke that limit of 3% uh, in the earliest place. Um, if you look at the US, Trump administration and Biden administration had a very high but, uh, um, deficit 
rate. And that is the reason also for the inflation. But we shouldn't be constrained by this number, 3%. In the most difficult period in 2020, with the impact of uh, the pandemic, we issued some special uh, treasury bonds. Uh, it's about 1 trillion. So GDP is about 100 trillion. So 1 trillion is about 1% deficit. It is not taken into account. Uh, uh, you know, an, uh, as, as a special special uh, treasury bond or debt. It is just treated as 1% deficit. Uh, at that time, uh, I already left the government. I didn't know. So I, I actually made some a comment in other occasions that it, it, it can just be 1% deficit it shouldn't be exceeding three percent thank you thank you uh we have many more questions but very little time i am going to give the final question i'm going to give the floor to professor christine wong who is part of the conference and i hope that will technologically work out that she actually can come into into the uh, into the view professor christine wong can you ask your question Yes, thank you. Uh, I think I will ask a question in English. Just now, you ask, you talk about the first round of the budget law. The focus is to increase taxation, to increase the revenue for the government. So then in the second round uh, in 2015, I can see that the focus, the uh, most important focus placed on uh, the power division between the local and central government. So you're talking about for the future, the next step of reform uh, is to going to be focused on the fiscal policy. For example, just now you, it, it, uh, you talk about a lot of uh, uh, property tax and income, personal income tax. So the first part of my question is that in China, the Chinese government, uh, the government regarding increase tax, uh, increase direct revenues, uh, they talk about it for a long time, but in, it, we still see that the personal income tax is very low. Uh, so when President Xi proposed the common prosperity uh, principle, why he didn't consider to increase the in personal income tax to collect more revenues from this avenue, uh, or, or in at least increase the percentage of this part to get more revenues uh, in order to realize the common prosperity. Is, that, is there a reason why? Uh, what, uh, or uh, is there any obstacles that English usually we, we always think about? There must be some impediments to prevent him from doing that. Uh, the second question is that last time when I met you, you talk about the increment of the VAT or the tax refund mechanism uh, and how you, the, 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 the collection mechanisms and how you can uh, use to uh, offset a certain expenditures. Uh, just now you also mentioned that uh, whether we use that as part of the central government's uh, revenue source, uh, if we can, if you put under the central government revenue source, then it can be um, stipul uh, gov regulated or governed governed by the central law, and then it can then be bounced back to the local government to to use for their specific uh, request. So, in, in this is has this been uh, implemented or uh, uh, resolved? So, I would like to know more about that. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention that in 2015's budget law is to localized uh, or the original central law uh, to make it more localized. It's not that it didn't exist. It was 
there already. It was just not uh, further localized. So in 2015, the main focus is uh, to transfer this more to the local government. Uh, but after we tra transfer that to the local government, how do we regulate them? Uh, and this is, is more stipulated in 2015 law. So just this is first thing to clarify. And why we can't just increase personal income tax uh, to make it a progressive tax, uh, for example, to uh, collect more tax from the personal households. Um, I give you some simple uh, answers. Take one example, capital gain tax. In, in USA, you also have tech, capital gain tax. Many countries have that. And also uh, for capital gain taxes, mainly to tax on the rich, rich people, right? Uh, but you have to know that in China, in, in Chinese market, in the stock market, a lot of people are doing trade uh, in, in stocks and securities, but they're very different from many other countries. Uh, in other countries, it's usually institution, but in China, most investors are personal investors, individual investors. So if we act on capital gain, or if we use cap collect, start collecting at capital gains, it's going to be a big implication because just now I mentioned 10% of the population controls 80% of the wealth in China. So we we actually made a stop to it uh, before, at, for one period of time, uh, it, it was being implemented, but we stopped it very quickly because we realized that 90% of the people actually um, will be affected. And uh, if we do implement those, those, uh, the, those new taxations, it will only collect money from those collect tax from the 10%, the 90% will be uh, negatively impacted. So when we talk about uh, increased revenues or re uh, resources or reallocate our, our our resources, we mainly have to think about the main, the majority of the population in China, will they be benefited? Will they be um, taken care of? So the, the most difficult part of us pushing this policy forward is to think how we can have those vested interest takers to um, take a less of a desirable position. On the other hand, to allow most of the population in China to enjoy more benefit. So this is the biggest problem that we're facing at the moment. So of course, to add more tax, uh, sorry, VAT or, or value added tax. Why is it now five, 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 five split? There's no local tax. Before, the largest VAT is the business tax uh, locally, but the business tax is not, is, is uh, exempted, it, it's not including the, the labor tax. Uh, uh, and, and then if we can, um, if we use that business tax, we also have to worry because it will cause a very big market split. Um, then also you will take away the main uh, resource of income for the local government. So when we talk about direct tax collection, uh, I think we always have to think about the vast interest uh, group. So those people who are already have the vested interests, uh, they may not be affected, but the, what, what about those people who are not uh, currently enjoying those benefits, we have to think about their welfare. So we, I think fundamentally we cannot share with local uh, government's authority. So we have to clear, uh, be clear on that. We have to be staying our uh, territory. So at the end of the day, we, we, we can only go for five by split. Um, if later on uh, we can think of a, a, a new method, a new way to, to, to collect tax without affecting the local uh, government's tax revenue, of course we will, we will go with that. But before that, we don't have any other choices. We can only go for five by split. So just now I gave you an example of Japan. Japan is to increase the consumption tax increase the uh, uh, 
uh, goods and services tax. And this is based on the retail total retail value of the local government. And I think this is quite reasonable because uh, this is to increase this is to tax on the consumption uh, volume, consumption total. Uh, but they also face the same issue because the local uh, revenue in that case also reduced. But comparatively, this is more reasonable. I don't know if I answer your question or not, but wow. uh, this is my elaboration. Uh, it's a it's a very very difficult question, and I think for the next two days we we're going to debate this and other questions in our academic conference. And so you have, <laughs> uh, Minister Low, you've given us a fantastic start in that conference and great insights into where China is and its reforms, but also what are some of the debates for reforms going forward. So we are very grateful. It was wonderful to have you uh, here in the conference. Thanks to many that joined us from uh, uh, outside as our guests to the conference. And of course, thanks to the conference participants. I look forward to seeing many of you back at the uh, Friday open session. There is a panel that will debate some of the findings. And I hope that many of you that are currently online will come back. Once again, thank you so much, Minister Law. Xie Xie Ni. Thank you very much too.